The theme of our workshop is soil health for a changing climate. So we heard from a climatologist yesterday that talked about trends in weather. Uh, some of the things he told us was that we're in a wet period the last 20 or 30 years and that they don't necessarily expect that to continue, that, that drought is a possibility. He showed us that one of the worst droughts we ever had was from 1952 to 56, so five years of what they, we had for 2012. Back in the 50s, they had it five years in a row. So what, the reason we're having this workshop is we want to we discuss soil health and try to figure out how we're going to have soils that can stand up to a drought like they had in the 50s. So some of the things that we discussed yesterday about how we, in, how we can get a drought resi resilient soil and how we can get a soil that will actually allow water to infiltrate. Uh, one is that we need to think about and farm for our soil organic matter and our soil microorganisms. So our microorganisms are going to help us build soil organic matter. Soil organic matter is going to allow us to absorb and hold water. M the microorganisms are also going to give us nutrient turnover, and give us healthier, more productive crops. One of the ways that we're going to improve our soil organic matter is to reduce or eliminate tillage and to use cover crops. Because we can't, we can't build organic matter unless we put the building blocks into the soil. And the building blocks are year-round cover, a living root year-round, and then one of the ways we do that is with cover crops. So now we're going to have Keith Burns talk to us about cover crops. Keith is a cover crop innovator from Bladen, Nebraska. He's the owner of Green Cover Seed. If any of you guys have ever used the Smart Mix calculator, um, he's world famous for developing that. So let's have Keith. Well, thank you and good morning. I don't know about world famous. <laughs> But uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here, uh, glad to be able to speak to you guys on cover crops. Uh, I debated for quite a while about what exactly I wanted to talk about. I wasn't exactly sure. I've had several different things. So I kind of I decided that I wanted to just, in this opening session, this first session here this morning, I wanted to just share some of the things that I've learned about cover crops over the past uh, six, seven years and uh, try to apply that to you guys' situations as much as possible. Then this afternoon, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the conceptual things that we go through when we help uh, our producers design mixes and just kind of take you through some of the thought processes on putting some of these cover crop mixes together and, and then demonstrate the, uh, the tool that uh, Carrie was referencing, the Smart Mix Calculator. Uh, that we use all the time to put these things together. So I've entitled this talk, Seven Things I've Learned About Cover Crops. Uh, there's certainly more than seven things, but these, uh, these are what I want to focus on here this morning. Just a little bit of background on us. Uh, my brother and I, we farm in south central Nebraska. So if you know where Grand Island, Nebraska is, just go straight south almost to the Kansas border, and that's where we are at. But we've been no-tilling there for 25 years. Our family's been farming that area for over 100. We've been 100% continuous no-till for the last 15 years. Uh, predominantly dry land, uh, and we're in about a 26-inch rainfall area, so we don't get as much rainfall as you guys do. Uh, we're about a third of our ground is irrigated, so we've got some options there. Uh, typically, we're doing a corn, bean and some sort of a cereal crop rotation. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, although we have started growing some weird kind of things uh, that we can sell through our seed business. We're growing uh, woolly pod vetch and chickling vetch and, and buckwheat and different things like that. Uh, we've been doing cover crops for the last five years and we started green cover seed in 2009. Uh, so this is the fifth year uh, that we've uh, had the seed business. So. Again, that's, that's kind of our background. I want to just share some of the things that we have learned in doing this. And the first thing that I learned, and this may not come as a surprise to my wife, certainly, but it came as a surprise to me, that I learned that I'm not smarter than God. And, you know, I mean, that, that's a, a little bit of a humorous statement because it goes without saying, but I think sometimes in our farming practices, we do think that we're smarter than God because we're trying to uh, go against the systems that he created. And so one of the concepts that we, uh, you know, basically what we try to do with the cover crops in our operation is we look at how God created plant communities and ecosystems, and then we try to learn from that and we try to mimic that in what we're doing on our own farming operation. So when we look at nature, when we look at the systems that, that God put in place, 
we see that there's great diversity of plants and roots and animals. And I'll talk more about diversity later, but that's, that's a huge point in what we're trying to accomplish with cover cropping, uh, it, but just not cover cropping, but the whole farming system as in, in, in general. Uh, we want to see this diversity that is found so often in nature. And again, we'll talk more about diversity a little bit later. The second thing that we see if we observe natural systems is we see that the soil is always covered. You know, you don't go out to a prairie system and see extensive amounts of tillage unless you've been there right after a glacier has moved through or an earthquake. You know, in nature, tillage is a catastrophic event. It is not natural. And we see this, we, we, you know, we pay the penalty when we go against the way that things were created and we try to do extensive amounts of tillage. Uh, this picture right here, uh, this was from 2009, and in 2009, <clears throat> we were very dry. This picture was taken in June, about the middle of June, and we were already seven inches behind normal for the year by the middle of June. So we had been very dry. We finally get a one inch rain. It's the first one inch rain we've had in, in months and months and months. And this is one of my neighbor's fields. I'm proud to say this is not mine. Uh, but he was an extensive tiller, and uh, this was summer fallow the year before, and he planted milo here after multiple, multiple tillage passes. And what you see here, the shiny stuff all the way down through here, that is not water that evaporated. That is water that is still standing in his field. And I took this picture 24 hours after a one inch rainfall in the middle of a drought, and he's got water not just standing on his end rows where he turned, but all the way down through this field. So this is not just compaction from turn rows. This is, this is tillage compaction. This is soil that has been completely destroyed by tillage, and he can't even infiltrate one inch of water during the drought. And his milo is puny and scrawny, and as you drop down over this hill, uh, you can just see that hill uh, is, is light colored because it's been washed down to the clay. And in the summertime, you can look at these hillsides, and it's just beautiful white with bindweed blooms. He is a, he's a great example of what not to do. One mile away, this is our field of corn. It was no-tilled into stripped wheat stubble that was followed with a high carbon cover crop. And this is what we got. Same situation, we were still seven inches behind normal. We got this one inch rain. How much of that one inch rain did I lose? None. I got every drop of that. There was nothing that ran off of this field because there was no soil exposed. I lost no soil. You know, he had, he had erosion here. Uh, he had a lot of water loss here, and it's simply because I'm keeping the soil covered, and that's so important. And, and again, I've got some other slides later on that will describe this concept more. But when we look at nature, you know, we see that there's great diversity of plants and animals. We see that the soil is always covered, and we see that there's always something alive and growing. And uh, even, even in the, the dead of the winter, you know, they're, they're, the perennial plants are still alive. They've gone dormant but they're still alive. And so that's what we try to emulate in our cropping systems. Now, that's not always easy to do. And so we have to figure out how we can make that work within the cropping system. So uh, what we do with the cover crops, this picture was taken, I think, at the end of January several years ago. But it was interesting because <clears throat> you can still see snow on the ground, but I still had live roots. I think this was a turnip here. There were live roots. And that soil wasn't frozen because I had so much residue and we had decent snow covered. It kind of melted away. But when we dug down there, we had worm activity, you know, six, eight inches below the soil surface at the end of January. And that's what we want. We want that soil to be alive. And if we have live roots out there, then they're going to support all of the biology. And the biology is what's going to drive the system. So we want something alive and growing all the time. This picture right here, you can, I don't know how well you can see that, but this corn plant is coming up right through a radish. Uh, you can see this radish has been sliced with my double disc openers, and that corn plant is growing right up through that old radish carcass. And that's a perfect example of what we want to see. We want to see uh, the next crop growing right up through the previous one, in this case a cover crop. Here uh, we're, we're harvesting uh, wheat or triticale, I'm not sure which this is, uh, with a stripper uh, head. Uh, it looks like it hasn't even been harvested because that's how a stripper head will leave the stubble. But we're coming right in behind it, same day, you know, within literally within minutes 
uh, we're getting another crop in. I think this happened to be double crop soybeans that particular year uh, because it's under a pivot. And I'll talk a little bit more about our double cropping strategies behind the cereals. Uh, but if we're not planting a double crop, we're planting a cover crop because we want something in there that's going to be alive. We want that root in there to support the soil biology, and we want that plant out there to cover and protect the ground so it's not washing away. And the fourth thing that we observe when we look at uh, how God created plant communities and ecosystems is that the plants cooperate with each other instead of being highly competitive. And if you look at the native prairie, you know, you'll see you know, not just two or three or four or even 10 or 12 species growing together out there, but you'll literally see dozens and dozens and, you know, even 100, 150. You know, the, the, the diversity of our prairie systems were incredibly immense. And these plants cooperated with each other instead of being highly competitive. And we see some of that same interactions going on within these diverse cover crop mixes like this. When you put the right species together, they will cooperate with each other instead of competing with each other. And, you know, they, the scientists have observed legume plants actually transferring uh, nitrogen across the mycorrhizal uh, bridge between a legume plant and a grass plant. And they're sharing nutrients back and forth. And they're sharing the resources that are there. And one helps the other. There's a study, um, I'm not smart enough to read the whole thing, but I read the little summary because it's a really long study, but I think it was put out by Brown University, a uh, pretty prestigious uh, uh, institution of learning. But the whole thing had to do with, in a stressful situation, how a plant community will become less competitive and more cooperative. And you would think it'd be just the opposite. You know, humans, if you put humans in a very stressful, limited resource situation, what are they gonna do? Every man for themselves. You know, if you don't believe that, you know, look at you know, when a hurricane's coming in, go, go to the grocery store and look at how well people are cooperating with each other. It is extremely competitive when resources become scarce amongst humans. But there, these researchers at Brown University weren't finding that. They were finding that under a limited resource situation that these plants were actually became more cooperative. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to get tremendous amounts of growth, but things were staying alive because these plants were co cooperating more with each other, especially under these stressful situations. And so that's what, again, that's what we want to emulate with our cover crops because it's very difficult to do this in our regular cropping situation. So we're going to emulate a lot of what we see in nature is what we want to emulate into our cover crops. And so that's, that's kind of the, the basis of what we... Uh, try to do when we think about cover crops and when we design cover crops. So that's the first thing I learned. Learn that I'm not smarter than God and uh, should never try to. Number two, we learned that a living soil equals a healthy soil equals higher yields. And soil biology is a key to unlocking that yield potential. And so when we can get the soil biology ramped up and we get it right, and there were several good speakers yesterday that talked about the biological aspect of that soil, when we get that ramped up and we get that right, we're going to have healthy soil, and that healthy soil is going to lead to higher yields. Now, cover crops are one of the best ways that we can improve the biological life of our soil. Because, and I think Terry Taylor talked about this, when you don't have something growing in there, and in fact, he didn't like soybeans because he felt like soybeans weren't contributing enough to the soil, but when you have something, when you have your soil setting idle with no living root in there, your soil biological life is either going to be go, go dormant or it's going to die off. And that's what we don't want. We want the biological life of the soil to always be active, always be growing, always be supported. And that can only happen when you have a living root in the soil that's giving out the carbohydrate exudates for those biological life forms to live on. And so cover crops, we believe, are one of the keys to making that happen. And, and there's even guys doing uh, companion-type cropping. And, and I noticed there were some questions about companion crops yesterday. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through here. But there's been a lot of documented incidences of where guys have planted winter wheat in the fall, and they've simply mixed in a couple pounds of radishes or a couple pounds of turnips. They may winter kill or they may get sprayed out the next spring 
But then those areas where they had that wheat tend to be more productive than areas where they didn't have the wheat. And nobody really has a definite answer about why they're seeing that yield increase. And it doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes you don't see a yield increase. But there's been enough documentation of yield increases that there's something going on there. And I believe it has to be biological. Somehow that's, it's stimulating additional f facets of the soil biology. And that's, uh, I think, releasing additional nitrogen. But there's been uh, a lot of documentation of that sort of thing. Um, I was just reading earlier this week uh, in the No-Till Farmer magazine, uh, Dave Robinson uh, is with uh, Legacy Seed. I think it's up in Wisconsin. But he, they just did a cover crop study, and No-Till Farmer magazine had this published. And just, just take a look at this. And, and uh, I would encourage you to go to the No-Till Farmer website. You don't have to write all this down, but I'm sure if you just go to notillfarmer.com, you'll be able to find this article. But uh, it was what they did was they'd been using cover crops on their farm for a number of years. Okay, so these numbers are coming from a very healthy system. These aren't beginner numbers. This is numbers from a farm that has been using cover crops for many years. But what he did is they finally they finally took a uh, a plot, you know, did a set of plots where they had cover crops and where they didn't have cover crops, a control, and they just looked at yield on, on corn uh, after soybean. So what they did is they seeded these different cover crops, and some of them were monoculture, just like winter rye, some of them were some mixes or blends, and then they had a control. But they seeded this into standing soybeans, and I believe uh, these guys farm, like I say, I think it's in southern Wisconsin or northern Illinois, somewhere uh, up in there in the northern Corn Belt. They seeded in the standing soybeans around the 1st of September, and this is the results that they got on the corn the following year. And again, you can read this in No-Till Farmer, but every cover crop they did led to benefits. It had not only paid for the seed cost, but it paid quite a bit more. Because some of these seed, the seed costs here probably range from $20 to maybe $40, $50 on some of the upper limits. Uh, but they were finding profit, net profit per acre on all these things. <clears throat> and I think this net profit per acre, uh, you know, 15 bushels of corn would be worth more than $40 back when they did the study. <laughs> that may be all it's worth now. But they've already subtracted the seed costs out of this net profit. So again, I'm not going to go into detail because this wasn't my study, but there are studies out there showing that cover crops are going to lead to higher yields, but you can't necessarily expect this the first year. And I think, again, Terry did a good job talking about that, that you've got to get the system going. But once you have that system up and going, the biological life is going to support that and it's going to continue to drive your system for you. The third thing that I've learned in, with cover crops, and I just call this, if you grow it, they will come. And again, this is focusing a little bit more on the biological aspect of the soil. Uh, and I am certainly no soil microbiologist, so I'm not going to go into great detail on this. And, and I can't even pronounce the names of a lot of the little critters that are down there. But we know that they're there. We know that they're working for us. I like worms because I can see them. I can count them. I can feel them. I can touch them. And we know that when we have good, healthy earthworm populations, we believe that the rest of the system is working as well. And, uh, you know, without getting the microscope out and looking at the really little guys, if we see a lot of worms out there, we believe that we've got a really healthy soil system. And again, cover crops are going to be what stimulate that. They're going to increase that. They're going to keep that soil biology alive. And uh, here's another picture. Uh, we've got one worm coming out of this, uh, this uh, piece of soil, but there's one, two, three, four, five, six, six other worm holes just in this one uh, piece of soil. And, you know, when you get a big rain, which a lot of times it seems like when the rains do come, they're coming more intense uh, and less often, when you get a big rain, if you got that many holes in your soil, that water is going in, and it's going in quickly. And that's what we want. Uh, so not only does the biological life keep the soil alive, but it also helps extensively with water infiltration. Uh, here's a close-up of a plant root, and these little strings that you see growing off this plant root, that's the mycorrhizal fungi uh, that you've heard a lot of people talk about. And it is one of the most critical components of the biological life of the soil because it is what is helping that root bring in different nutrients, it's what's bringing in additional water. 
if you have uh, good mycorrhizal fungi colonization on your plant roots, your, your crop is going to be much more drought tolerant. It's going to be a much more efficient user uh, of the fertility that is out there. So it's absolutely critical that you have good mycorrhizal fungi and tillage will just completely destroy the system. But if you've got a bridge crop in there, a cover crop, the mycorrhiza can go from one crop to the cover crop and then back to your next crop. And so again, that's why it's important you have a living root there so you can keep these biological components of your soil alive and going. The fourth thing that we've learned is there is great power in diversity. And I talked about diversity a little bit in the first point, but I think it's important enough, and I want to focus on this one a little bit more, go into some specific examples of how we can introduce more diversity into our cropping systems, because we know that in nature there is huge diversity. We've already talked about that, that the native prairie, you know, had 100 plus different plant species all growing together. And some years you would see certain species express more than others because of climate. And, and that's what gives such resilience to the system is when you have all these different species, regardless of the weather conditions, there's going to be something in there that will thrive. There's going to be something in there that will work well. It's not everything every year, but there's going to be something in there that will work well. <clears throat> now, in our cropping systems, we don't have that diversity. We typically grow crops in monoculture, and there's, there's good reasons for that because you know, it makes, you know, it, it's, it's very difficult to grow cash crops together. Now, there's some guys experimenting with it, and I think you'll see some innovative things coming out, but as of right now, it's very difficult, and, and you know, it will get you thrown out of most of the insurance programs if you're trying to grow more than one cash crop at the same time. You know, so if, if you're you know, if you have to have crop insurance, you have to be really careful about how you do this. But for the most part, our cash crops are all monoculture. And that's okay because that's, you know, that's how we can be productive and efficient. But we need to introduce diversity into our cropping systems in other ways. Because diversity is so important. Uh, because the advantages of diversity, diversity is it gives us more resilience. And again, the resilience part means it can adapt to whatever conditions are out there. And, and that's why when we do some of these cover crops, especially when it can be a summer planted cover crop, you know, we like to put 8, 10, 12 things in that cover crop mix because the weather conditions will dictate which things really thrive and which things maybe don't. But I want to have something in there that's really going to thrive. So we're putting a lot of different things in at relatively low amounts, so we're not necessarily increasing the cost uh, exponentially from, from a less diverse mix, but we're just giving more diversity. And this afternoon I'll talk more about how you can add that diversity in there, how you can plan for that diversity, what are some of the thought processes we go through as to which things we put in these mixes. But we definitely get more resilience. We have lots more options as well. When you have more diversity in your cropping system, you have a lot more options. And I'll talk some about uh, some of the options coming up here in a little bit. You have a lot of flexibility. If the only thing that you grow is corn, then you're pretty much locked into corn, corn, corn. But if you've got four or five other cash crops that you're growing, if it's too wet to get your corn in, well, I've got other options down the road here. Uh, if I'm growing one crop and it gets hailed out, well, I've got other options because I can come in with a short season crop, you know, maybe sunflowers or millet or buckwheat or something like that. But if you're locked into just one or two crops, you've got very few options if something bad happens. And you're obviously going to have more biology because the more diversity that you have, the more biological life you'll have in your soil. And you're going to have less inputs and you're going to have less weeds and less diseases and less insects. And, and I mean, anybody that's ever taken an agronomy class, you, you know, that's one of the first things you learn about crop rotations. The reason you do crop rotations because is it reduces the, the weed pressure, it reduces the disease pressure, reduces the insect pressure as opposed to doing a monoculture year after year after year. So the diversity within the cropping system will lead to less of these inputs and it also, I, I would put out there, it, it's less risky for you. Now it requires a higher level of management, no doubt. It, it may require some specialized equipment and some specialized knowledge. But any time that you have a, a higher management system, you're, the opportunity for higher rewards is going to be there. And uh, so, so the guys with more diversity, I think, are going to have less risk and more options 
Uh, but you have to be willing to work, and you have to be willing to learn, and you have to be willing to figure out how a lot of this stuff fits in. So let's look at ways we can do that within our regular cropping systems, some practical ways. So number one, we can have a better crop rotation. Okay. Now in my area, and it may be the same here, I don't know, you know, a typical crop rotation is going to be corn soybeans. And uh, there are some guys that uh, they, their crop rotation is uh, one year it's Pioneer corn and the next year it's NK corn. That's, that's their rotation. You know, they're not doing the same thing every year. They're rotating corn companies. But we need to expand that crop rotation if we want to get the diversity and get all the benefits of having that diversity within that system. So the easiest thing to do is to add a cereal crop. You know, instead of just being corn beans, you look at going corn beans wheat or corn beans rye or, or some sort of cereal crop, something that you can harvest in the summertime because it's a totally different type of plant. You know, it's a cool season plant versus a warm season plant. And that is going to do wonders in disrupting the, the cycles and the patterns of your weeds, your insects, and your diseases. And so by adding that, that third crop, that summer harvested crop in there, you'll disrupt all those systems. Now, I know that people will say, but I can't make any money growing wheat. And, and that may be true uh, for a number of reasons. I think a lot of times people don't really treat wheat like a real crop. You know, they short it on inputs and then wonder why they only get 40 bushel wheat. So there are ways that you can grow better wheat but wheat also gives you the opportunity to add something else in there, especially in your area down here. You've got a longer growing season than we do, and you get more moisture on, on, as a general rule. And so you can have a lot of opportunities coming in after wheat. And double crop options, obviously beans are a very popular double crop option, but I think you guys could, and, and, and I'll, just, I'll just put it out there right now, I don't like double crop beans. Uh, and the main reason why I don't like double crop soybeans is this, because when I harvest those double crop soybeans, I have to run all that nice wheat stubble that I've just produced, I have to run that all back through the combine in the fall. And so now that soil is more like soybean stubble than it is like wheat stubble to go through the winter. It's going to be much more exposed. I'm not going to have any snow catchability. Uh, I've, I've processed a lot of my carbon that I produced and it's just going to break down and degrade much faster than what I really want. So we used to do double crop beans behind our irrigated wheat. We no longer do that and it's mainly because of a residue issue. I don't want to run that, that uh, straw back through my combine because we're now raising rye and triticale and we're using a stripper head so most of my cereal fields have stubble that's four to five feet tall. And it's beautiful. And I want to keep it there. I don't want to run that back through the combine. So what we've started doing is we've double cropped corn. And last year we planted corn on July 8th in Nebraska. So, and it, and it made about 100 bushel. It was 86 day corn. Now we were fortunate. We were blessed with a, with a relatively late frost. And uh, that really helped us. Uh, we felt that's really too late to be doing corn. So this year we double crop sunflowers and we finished planting double crop sunflowers July 20th because we were even later because it was a weird spring. Everything was late. You know, the cool weather just kept delaying things. Uh, very wet June. We just couldn't get things to dry down. So it was late. I don't know if those sunflowers are going to make it or not, but we'll see. But the nice thing about double crop sunflowers is that sunflowers are going to allow a lot more light penetration through the canopy than corn does. And so now when I planted my double crop sunflowers, I also planted about eight other things in there. I've got winter peas and I've got chickpeas and I've got lentils and I've got crimson clover. I've got buckwheat. I've got mustard. We've got all these other things growing down underneath the sunflowers. The sunflowers will get tall enough that if they mature, which again, we're praying for a late frost, but if they mature and we're able to harvest them, that harvesting operation will all go on up above my, my companion crops and I won't disturb them when I harvest so I can take a cash harvest plus I've got all this wonderful diversity going on down below here and I can turn in and I can get a lot of grazing out of that uh, in the late fall. You know, because those flowers will be harvested late if they get harvested. And if they don't get harvested, I've still got the grazing aspect and I've still got the soil benefits aspect. 
Now, we wouldn't have those opportunities if we weren't doing that cereal in our rotation. If all we were doing is corn soybeans, we'd never have that opportunity to do that type of thing. The other thing that you can do is just simply do a grazing cover crop. Or Dave Brandt, he grows wheat in Ohio, and most of his neighbors will plant double crop soybeans. He told me the average, the county average yield is about 20 bushel soybeans. Dave Brandt no longer does any double crop soybeans because he is making more money by putting a high legume cover crop in and then growing 160 to 180 bushel corn the next year on very little inputs. He's growing his nitrogen. He's basically doing a double crop of a nitrogen after his wheat and then planting corn into that and having phenomenal success. So he sees that he's getting more value out of that. So my point is, is that once you open your mind up to expand your crop rotation, there's a lot of different things that you can do when you put that third crop in there. That summer harvested crop gives you a long fallow period and you can really get creative in what you do. You know, Linus over here, you know, you're double cropping Japanese millet, double cropping sunflowers. You know, you guys could easily double crop buckwheat. Uh, I'd say you could double crop corn here almost every year, I would guess. Now, is it gonna make corn every year? Probably not, but I'll bet it makes it more often than it doesn't. And again, you know, uh, if, if you're looking to harvest something every year, it may not be for you, but the guys that are willing to take that risk, I think are gonna have a lot more reward opportunities out there. Another way to increase diversity in your cropping system is to do companion crops. Not gonna spend a lot of time on this because we don't know a lot. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of experimenting being done, a lot of looking being done at this, uh, but a companion crop is where you're growing more than one crop at a time. Now, it may be that you're harvesting both of them for a cash crop. Uh, again, if I can pick on Linus over here, you're, he's growing cereal rye and hairy vetch together, harvesting them both together, and then his cleaner is getting them separated, and he can sell both. Most companion cropping is you have your cash crop, and then you have other things down below it growing, like I was talking about with the sunflowers. I'm only harvesting one thing there. Uh, but there are uh, other benefits from the companions. Hopefully those legumes will produce some nitrogen to feed my sunflowers. Now, here's the challenges that we found with companion cropping. So before you go out there and just start throwing companion crops out with all your crops, it's hard. It's really hard. Uh, the, the three biggest challenges that we have faced, number one is weed control, because once you put that companion crop out there, you're very limited in what you can spray for weed control. Now, uh, if you're in a broadleaf situation like the sunflowers, and we didn't put any additional grasses in, we can go out there with select or clethodim or something, and we can clean up grass issues. I can take care of my volunteer triticale uh, with clethodim, but any broadleaves, you know, hey, they're they're <laughs> they're a part of the mix. So weed control is a big thing. And uh, that's one of the challenges you'll have to face. If you're going to try this somewhere, I suggest trying it on small plots. So if it blows up on you, you, you your, your, your damage is limited. I, that's how we try everything is on relatively small acres until we see what happens. Um, the, the other thing is um, the uh, nitrogen fixation. You know, it's a great concept to say that my legumes are going to feed my corn crop or my sunflower crop, but the reality of it is we're not willing to risk my yield on those cash crops by not putting nitrogen on early. Because if I don't get my nitrogen on early, that corn or that sunflower really suffers. And when I do put my nitrogen on early, well, guess what those legumes do? They're just taking that, you know, they're, you know, they're lazy, just like a lot of people. They're going to take the free handout before they have to go to work. And so we've really struggled with trying to get our legumes to nodulate and produce nitrogen because they're taking up the free nitrogen that's already in the soil that I put out there for the cash crop. That maybe can be addressed with timing. Uh, it maybe can be addressed under some pivots. You know, we're trying to limit how much nitrogen we put on early and then we can put on additional nitrogen later in the season. I, I don't know, we haven't figured that out yet, but that's one of the big challenges that we have to work through is how do we get that nitrogen on without the legumes just taking it up? And, and maybe it's okay, uh, you know, but just don't plan on that legume totally feeding your crop. Now, 
The Dave Brants and the Gabe Browns, they're getting it to work because they're putting very little commercial nitrogen on because they've got so, such high organic matters, they've been doing cover crops for many years, they're getting tremendous amounts of natural nitrogen release from their soil, and I think that's a much better system. The legumes don't take as much of that because it's not just all this free nitrogen setting in the ground, it's more of a time release from the decomposition of residue and organic matter, and so that's a much better system than putting so much nitrogen out there prior to planting the crop. You know, in that situation, uh, the legumes are just going to take it up. Uh, crop insurance is another big hurdle you have to, to jump through. If you're doing companion cropping like this, you're probably not going to be eligible for crop insurance on it. That, that will throw you out of the program. So typically when we're doing companion crops, uh, it is on something that we're double cropping that we don't insure anyway. So just, just know that if you're going to dabble in this, uh, it may uh, disqualify you from a lot of the crop insurance programs. Another way you can introduce diversity into your cropping system is to do forage rotations, uh, do year-round grazing. Now, if corn is $3 and feeder cattle are $3, you do the math, you know. Uh, and I've got some pictures here uh, of, uh, of a customer out in western Kansas, uh, and, and he's done the math, and he's going to make a ton of money uh, where a lot of other guys are going to lose money on the corn. So I'll show you those pictures in just a second here. And then the, you know, if you don't want to do any of those other things, if you don't, if you're not uh, interested in changing your crop rotation, you're happy with the rotation that you have, then the logical way to add diversity to your system, if you don't want to do anything with your regular crop rotation, is to get cover crops in whenever you can. And it's a very good way to add diversity to your system because you now can put a lot of different things out there without having to learn how to harvest or market new crops. You know, buckwheat would be great. You guys could all grow buckwheat. But if everybody in the room grew buckwheat, you know, maybe three of you would get some sold. Okay? There's definitely issues. And if you're not willing to do the marketing or learn how to grow and harvest these things, then get the diversity in through the cover crop mixes. I tell people, you know, because people ask, well, what kind of cover crops can I grow for seed? And my answer to them is, you can grow a lot of different cover crops for seed. You know, hairy vetch, it's easy to grow. It's really hard to harvest. Is that right, Linus? <laughs> a lot of these things, you know, buckwheat, it's easy to grow. It's extremely indeterminate. It's a, it's a bear to harvest because you've got to go out there and spray it because it, it'll bloom for months. And it'll have mature seed popping out of the pods. And what makes a good cover crop is something that's very indeterminate because it just grows and grows and grows. That's a great cover crop. It's a real pain as a cash harvested crop. And so the, by using it as a cover crop and not as a cash crop, it lowers the amount of management that you have to do. You don't have to have specialized harvest equipment. You really don't have to have specialized planting equipment because you can just put it in with a grain drill. And uh, it, it gives you the ability to get a lot of diversity into your system without having to add a lot of marketing and harvesting knowledge. So again, a lot of these things are easy to grow, but they're hard to harvest and process and store and, and sometimes market. So those are kind of the options. I just got some pictures here uh, of some of the things that we've done. This is that double crop corn that I was telling you about from uh, 2012. This is irrigated corn double cropped into rice stubble. Um, we planted this the end of June. Last year we didn't get stuff planted until about uh, uh, June 10th, uh, th or I'm sorry, July 10th. This picture uh, was, uh, we got this corn planted at the end of June. This picture was taken uh, July 22nd, so that corn had been growing for three weeks. One thing about double crop corn, when you plant corn into soil temperatures that are in the mid 80s, it's up in three days, and it is going to grow fast. You know, so don't plan on planting your corn and then coming back a week later to, to you know, hit it with chemicals that would kill the corn because that corn is going to jump out of the ground. But look at the amount of residue that I have. You know, this is all my rye stubble still sticking up. So I've got a tremendous amount of residue and ground cover here. Uh, there's another picture of it there, double cropped into that rye stubble. I've got a tremendous amount of stubble down there, uh, great for the biological life of the soil. Uh, here's another picture taken three weeks later. Uh, so this, this was uh, about six weeks into the growth, and that corn will be seven feet tall in six weeks. It grows extremely fast, 
and you want to plant a short season corn, I think this was like 95 day corn, but we determined that was too long a season for what we we're trying to do, so we went to 86 day. Yes? Good question. The question was how much nitrogen did we put on? Uh, what we were wanting to try to accomplish was we wanted to get that stubble down to the ground if we could, because this stubble was five feet high. And we were worried about the shading effect of the stubble on that small plant, because we knew that every day was critical. So we didn't want to delay our corn growth by having the stubble shading it. So what we did is we took our air seeder, a uh, 43-foot air seeder, and I ran over this stubble just applying fertilizer. I was putting uh, 46 urea on. Uh, and I probably put uh, 120, 130 pounds of urea on with the drill, thinking that, you know, that drill would help uh, mat, push some of that stubble to the ground. And it did, but primarily where the tractor tires ran over it. Uh, with, with rye stubble that's been mature like that, it's very springy. A lot of it, you know, popped right back up. So I don't know if we really accomplished our goal as much as we wanted to. Uh, but it's, it's still, it still helped. Uh, but that's how we put the nitrogen on, probably 120, 130 pounds uh, with a drill. Uh, the, last year when we did it, uh, I, with the drill, I put on maybe 50 or 60 pounds of nitrogen along with some companion crops, some legumes and different things out there. And that, again, it was only marginally successful because we had some weed issues and we ended up spraying a lot of the companion crops out because we had to get on top of some of the water hemp and, and different things. Uh, and then we put additional nitrogen on through the pivot in that situation. Um, but yeah, it'll grow very quickly and you can, you can uh, I, I think if you guys are planting that 85 to 90 day corn, you know, yield potential on that I think is still gonna be, you know, 100 plus bushels. Uh, this corn in, from 2012, you know, it made, we had, we had uh, one variety was 102 day and one was 95 day. And uh, the 95 day yielded about 10 bushels more. It was making 110 to 120 uh, because it was just that much more mature. The 102 day hadn't quite made it to black layer. Uh, so, you know, we had some pretty light corn that year, you know, and it stood out in the field until probably the first week of December. You know, when we thought there was snow coming in, we went out and harvested it. But we let it dry in the field as long as possible. We put it in a bin. We dried it down. It was light, but it was right next to two other bins that had good full season corn in it. And we were able to, you know, blend it off. And, you know, most of it, well, it all got sold either through the ethanol plant or the feedlot. And we were able to blend it to where we didn't take a hit on, on either the moisture or the test weight. Um, so again, if you're going to do this, you know, if you, by us having the facilities to hold it and to blend it, you know, we didn't take a penalty on it. Like if I had hauled it straight to town, there would have been a pretty good uh, dock for test weight and for moisture on that. Uh, the other nice thing about doing this is look at the nice cover crop that I have coming underneath that corn canopy. I've got a wonderful cover crop of volunteer rye coming back because you know, I didn't, you know, with the stripper head, you have a fair amount of uh, header loss. There's almost no loss out the back end of the combine with a stripper head, but you have some header loss. But the nice thing about that is, is now my, my uh, volunteer is very evenly distributed. Because again, with the stripper head, I'm losing it out of the head and not the back of the combine. So I don't have to worry about spreading that because uh, there's very little straw going through. So I had a really nice stand of volunteer rye coming up and so we turned in and we grazed that, and uh, it was wonderful late winter grazing because I had all these corn stalks plus all this volunteer rye. Okay, number five, the fifth thing that we've learned is that cattle love the salad bar. Just like we love going through the salad bar and having a great amount of diversity, cattle love the same thing. This is a picture from Gabe Brown. Uh, this, uh, I believe, is uh, Triticale and Harry Vetch. And uh, he is grazing uh, some yearlings out there and probably putting two to two and a half pounds of gain a day on those things. And he's fencing in small areas, bunching them up and doing some mob grazing. And he'll just move that fence a little bit each day and putting a lot of weight on those cattle. But cattle will balance their own diet if you give them the choices. Probably much better than people do. <laughs> You give people a lot of choices. Sometimes they don't always make the best, uh, the best choices. But cattle will do a pretty good job of doing that. Now I want to show you a series of pictures uh, from uh, Nathan Pierce, 
Nathan Farms in Western Kansas. And uh, I don't know if you guys have ever been to Western Kansas, but it, it's harsh. It's brutal. They've been, you know, he's in a 15 to 16 inch rainfall area on a good year. And they've been in several years of a drought. And he, plant, the, he got this seed from us uh, probably around the first of May, and he planted this probably about the middle of May. And he planted it two different times. And I just want to read you his comments here and then show you some of the pictures. This is field number one, plants that seem to be doing good as a grazing corn, sunflowers, turnips, collards, and buckwheat. I had no idea brassicas would grow so good during the summer. And, and I didn't either. You know, because typically you think of radishes, turnips, collards, rapeseed, you know, typically the general rule of thumb would be, well, you know, wait till mid-August to plant those. It's going to be too hot. And western Kansas gets hot, and it gets windy. It's hotter there than it is here. And it's much drier, and it's much windier. It's a harsh, harsh environment. But he basically said, I had no idea these brassicas would grow so good during the summer. They are generally huge. And that was very surprising to us as well. And I think part of what's happening is because they're growing in this mass of diversity, you know, the tallest plant out here obviously is the grazing corn and the sorghum, and it's providing a shading effect for those brassicas, and it's changing the microclimate where those brassicas are growing. And so if it's 100 degrees out, you know, that corn and that sorghum is taking the brunt of, of that solar radiation, and it's, it's much cooler, and uh, down under that canopy, it, you know, it's a higher level of humidity because it's, it's got the moisture trap down there to some extent. It's just a different growing environment, and so those things can, can thrive where if you had just a field of straight turnips growing through western Kansas July, they'd probably just burn up. But he's getting them to grow because, again, these plants are cooperating and not competing. So he says they're generally huge. The buckwheat is also way bigger than I thought it would be. A lot of it is three feet tall. And by the way, we are still not at average rainfall for the year in Wallace County, so don't think this crop is growing on a ton of moisture. 15 to 16 inch rainfall, and they're behind. And he's still got a crop that looks like that. Now, he, uh, he sent me these pictures about three weeks ago, and, and shortly after he sent me these pictures, he turned out 600 head of steers into this field. 600 head of steers, those things, will, they'll, they'll easily gain two and a half pounds a day. So he's getting 1,500 pounds of gain a day on probably some four and 500 weight steers. And that, what's that gain worth? Between two and a half, three bucks right now? You know, do the math. You know, $3,000, $3,500 a day? That's for sure going to be $3 corn out there. Because with the, with the weather conditions they have, if they, if they grow 80 bushel corn, they are, they are thrilled to death on dry land out there. So he's got this figured out. He can do the math. Uh, just another picture. Uh, he sent me this picture and said something about, at first he thought the green cover seed guys had quality control issues. Uh, so we show this because of the diversity. Uh, I, I, I really have no idea <laughs> what they were doing, but it was kind of funny. But it gives a little bit of a scale. I mean, you can see this stuff is, you know, up about to this guy's uh, armpit. Um, the pineapple, I think, was, uh, was uh, introduced by them and not any part of our seed. Uh, one other thing I do want you to notice, though, is you see this right here, and this other picture had some, too. I don't know if you guys have kochia out here. Do you guys have kochia? Okay. Kochia is a brutal weed out there for those guys. It's ALS resistant, starting to be glyphosate resistant. It, it's one of the weeds they fight the most out there. He's not worried about it at all. Because kochia at this stage, kochia, when it grows big, it's tumbleweed. Okay, so when you see the tumbleweeds rolling through the Old West movies, that's kochia. And so it'll get big and it'll get real bushy and it's very unpalatable. But at this stage, it's actually a pretty good grazer. Fairly high in protein. He's not worried about that kochia growing with that because he's going to put 600 steers out there. He's going to group them up fairly tight. They're either going to eat that kochia or they're going to trample it into the ground. It's not going to be a problem. Here's the second field that he planted. Uh, he planted this one two weeks behind the other one. Hopefully we'll get another two feet of growth in the next three weeks before we put cattle out. So he's going to graze this first field with these 600 steers, and then he'll move right over to the other field. And he, what he's doing is he's staging it 
so that when he's got the steers in there, this stuff is at its prime growth. You know, he doesn't want to plant two quarters all at the same time because by the time he gets to the second quarter, some of that stuff may be too mature. So we delayed his planting two weeks. Amazing growth on all species, two foot tall soybeans, 18 inch tall chickpeas, maybe a little too much brassica growth. I never thought I'd have somebody tell me they thought their brassicas were growing too much in western Kansas heat through July and August. That, that, that's amazing. Uh, we took samples from both fields today, so we'll know nutrient and feed values later this week. I, I don't know if he's got those back. He hasn't sent them to me yet. Uh, but you can see this is kind of a close-up. Uh, he had four or five different kinds of brassicas in here. I know some of this that he did last year, this stuff was testing out at almost 30% protein. It, and in fact, he cut back on how many brassicas he had in his mix this year because he thought it was too hot of a mix last year. Just another picture. Uh, great diversity. He's got sunflowers in there. Sunflowers are excellent grazing when they're at this stage. The cattle will eat those leaves. Uh, they'll even clip the heads off and eat them. Uh, the sorghums, the grazing corn, different brassicas, different legumes. He had probably 10 or 12 different things in this mix. And uh, again, he's doing the math. And with corn approaching $3 and feeder cattle approaching $3, if any of you guys got cattle, I think you need to seriously consider putting your weight on them doing this instead of growing, and not the whole farm, but maybe a field. Because you can put some tremendous gains on, and if you don't have cattle, maybe find someone that does and see if you can strike an agreement, uh, have them pay you on the gain that they would get from your field. But the one thing you need to remember, and, and we always try to stress, because the cowboy in a person a lot of times will uh, overrule the farmer in a person, and you tend to graze way too much. You need to remember to leave at least half of your residue for the critters below the ground. Because all this biological life in your soil, you need to feed them. And if you let the cattle take it all, then you'll actually go backwards on soil health. If you graze it right, you'll get tremendous increases in the amount of soil health, the amount of organic matter that you can accumulate. But if you overgraze it or if you mismanage it, you will have a penalty the next year on your crop. We've done it. I know. Because a lot of times the way we graze things, and this is the wrong way to do it, when the neighbor calls and says, hey, your cows are out, it's time to move them. That's not the way to do it. Uh, we're, we're working on that. But the guys that got it figured out and the guys that are intensely grazing and they're trampling a lot of it to the ground, they're having wonderful results. Number six, got to hurry up and finish up here. A cover-up is a good thing. Residue covering the ground makes the whole system work. And again, these are the pictures I showed you earlier, but I want to show them again because it's all about how much residue you can have in your soil. Because, you know, the, the fact that you're not tilling the ground is good, but the main benefit you're getting there is you're keeping the soil covered. And Rolf Derps, who is one of the pioneers, kind of one of the godfathers of the whole no-till movement, he's, a, he's an agronomist from Paraguay, he, I heard him say this once, he says, almost all the advantages of the no-till system come from the permanent covering of the soil, and only a few of the advantages come from not tilling the soil, the physical act of not tilling. That's important, but it's not nearly as important as keeping that soil covered. We should always aim at full soil cover. And if I had time, I'd show you a couple videos that I took a couple years ago of long-term no-till ground right next to me. The farmer lost his lease on this ground, and it is all within the same family, so it's very dysfunctional. He lost the lease, so he got mad at them, so he says, I'm going to show you. He came in after corn harvest, and he had somebody rake it twice. Well, they went in there with a shredder first, and they shredded the stalks to the ground. They ran the rake over it twice, and he hauled off every last little bit of residue that he could to the feedlot. And he did the same thing right across the road. He had a quarter section of beans, dry land. And he raked up every last little bit that he could and hauled it off to the feedlot and probably got 50 bucks a ton. So then the next spring, that stuff blew like it was the Dust Bowl. And there was a little bit of justice, I guess, because he still farmed one quarter right to the north of the one that he had raped and pillaged. And he probably lost 20 acres of his crop because that blowing dust just literally cut his crop off, you know, for the first several hundred feet. But no-till by itself is not going to work if you remove all the residue. And I'm sure you guys have seen the same things around here. 
when you have a no-till system without any residue covering the soil, it is marginally better, and in some instances, maybe not even as good as a conventional till system. It's the residue that's driving it, and we have to keep that on there. I took this picture when I was in Brazil. Uh, I actually went on a, a tour of Brazil with Rolf Derps in a, in a group with no-till on the plains. This is the guys out there planting corn in Brazil, and uh, this is their, you see this guy right here? That's their planter monitor, okay? When, when they run low on seed, he'll throw a clod at the cab of the tractor there so they can stop and fill it up. That's their planter monitor. But the reason I took this picture is they run a big old shank up in front of every row unit. So they're no-tilling, but they've got a lot of soil exposed and they've got a lot of soil disturbance. And that kind of bothered us, but then we thought it looked pretty familiar to a lot of operations we see here in the United States, you know, called strip-till. It's really not that much different. You know, you look at this, and, you know, this is strip-till, and yeah, you've got residue here, but look at all this soil that's exposed. And, you know, our philosophy is we don't need to do that. We don't want to do that. I don't want to see that soil exposed. This is what we want to see. This is how we plant corn. We've taken our residue openers off. They're sitting on a pallet. They're for sale if you're interested. We just run double disc openers. We replace them every year. We have plenty of down pressure on a planter. You've got to have weight and down pressure and sharp blades, and you can plant through virtually anything. And uh, like I say, this, this uh, you know, was a five feet tall triticale stubble. But the cover crop helps knock it down, helps it gets processed. And again, you can see this radish right here, this corn plant coming right up through there. Uh, here's some other pictures. I'm almost finished here. I know I'm running a little late, but this is irrigated corn planted into cover crop rye. Look at the residue cover that I've got. Now, this rye was killed out 10 days before I planted, okay? 10 days before I planted, that's, that's typically the recommendation that we would say. We want to we get that rye completely dead before we plant. But in this field, we did an experiment, and we took a 90-foot strip, and uh, we did not spray that until three weeks after we planted the corn. And that's what the residue looked like here. Same day, took the picture of the same day, look at the difference in residue. This is a rye sprayed out 10 days before planting. This is what it looked like when we sprayed it out three weeks after planting. Now, you can see, here's this 90-foot strip right here, and I would say for the first two months, eh, yeah, probably for the first 50 days, you could see this strip was visibly shorter than the rest of the field. After that, it caught up, and then after that, that 90-foot strip was taller than the rest of the field because that soil was cooler, it was holding more moisture. Now this was under a pivot, so we were, we were watering this, and, and we did have to water. 2012 was very dry for us, and we had to run the pivot earlier than what we normally would have because this strip was dry. There's no doubt about that. If this would have been dry land, that would have been a disaster. It would not have worked. But where we had the pivot, we, we could make it work. Now, uh, we didn't really see a tremendous amount of yield difference. There certainly was no yield drag where we did that, but we didn't really necessarily see an increase in yield. Uh, but the increase in the residue was, was phenomenal. Uh, again, here you can see the line. Here's where the rye was sprayed out three weeks after planting. Here's where it was sprayed out 10 days before planting. A huge difference in the amount of residue uh, that we're showing there. Uh, let me go back one. Um, the, the other, uh, I was telling some guys this yesterday, another thing that we tried, and I don't have a picture of it, I wanted to have a picture to show, uh, is that last year or, th or this spring, the cover crop rye where we were planting soybeans, instead of spraying that rye out with glyphosate, we sprayed it with clethodim or generic select. And what that did is glyphosate will, will hammer rye, and that rye will be dead within a few days, especially if you're putting a, a big load of surfactants in it. And we kind of felt that it was killing that rye too quickly and degrading it too fast. And so we sprayed it with clethodim in, a, in about a half rate on some of it. And it killed that rye very slowly. And with soybeans, that was great because I had wonderful residue there for those soybeans. And we, it actually didn't completely kill that rye when we came back, when we post-sprayed the soybeans. It, it finished the rye off. But it kind of stopped it from using moisture, but it allowed it to continue to mature. And uh, so... You know, there's, there's guys doing things like that to try to manage the crop, but yet still uh, maximize the amount of residue and carbon that's out there. So 
The last thing that we learned is in spite of everything that's going on, you have to remember to focus on your most important crop. Uh, this is my family. Uh, my wife and, and uh, these three girls are here with me. They'll probably be here for this afternoon session or at least at the end. Uh, so, uh, you know, th this whole concept of, of, of diversity, you know, people think we're taking this a little too far because we've got, uh, we've got two kids that are married. My son Simeon, he's married to Kristen. And my daughter Rachel, she's married to Samuel. They've got one child and they're both expecting, uh, they'll both have babies in November. Then I've got two boys that uh, are in college, and then we've got these three little girls. So, you know, we're doing our part to have diversity within our family, within our farming operation. And, you know, I, I, uh, I, I told some people, you know, I said, you know, no-till farming, uh, it, it just takes less time. You're not out on the tractor so much. And I say, you know, I don't know what you guys are doing with your extra time, but, no, you know. Uh, do we have time for questions or do we need to get on the tours? Time for a couple questions. Yes. Um, I have a question about the guy in western Kansas. Yes. And he, he grazed that pretty diverse cover crop. Um, what did he do after that? Did he put a crop in it after that? Well, he, he's grazing it right now. He sent me these pictures just several, a couple weeks ago. What will so, he do, though, after that? Uh, most likely, he will go to a, uh, if he gets the moisture, he'll probably go to wheat this fall. If he doesn't get the moisture to replenish what that cover crop used, uh, he'll probably hold it over and probably plant uh, grain sorghum uh, next, next spring. Uh, they typically don't plant a lot of corn out there on their dry land acres, so he'll probably either go to wheat if he feels like he's got the moisture to do that, or he'll go to sorghum next fall, or next spring. And, and so he doesn't graze far, he leaves quite a bit of stubble well, he'll, he'll graze it hard, but he won't graze it long. And, and so what they'll do is, you know, he'll have cover crop out there probably four feet tall, and he'll probably crowd those 600 steers into less than two acre paddocks and probably be moving them a couple times a day. And so they're probably trampling, you know, the 50% that he's leaving probably is getting just trampled down. And, and that's, that's, for, that's for his soil. His target is to leave 50%. I, I think it is, yeah, I think his target is to leave 50%. And I suspect after he grazes it, it's early enough, if he catches a rain, he'll get enough regrowth, he'll be able to graze it again. If he doesn't get the moisture, he probably won't. But if he, if he catches a rain, he'll be able to graze that a second time. Because it's all warm season stuff, it'll regrow very well in the heat. Uh, the, well, the brassicas aren't warm season, but everything else is. And if he doesn't get a rain, then he's still, you know, had a lot of good gain and had a lot of good soil benefits, which is what he's after. Yes? What's the 10-day Yeah, the question is, what's the 10-day connection? I said that that's our typical practice of spraying that rye out 10 days ahead of planting corn. You know, there's, there's a, a lot of talk about rye being allelopathic to corn, and we, listening to the experts, what they say is that when that cereal rye is decomposing, it releases some sort of chemical compound that can inhibit the germination of a corn seedling. And, and the, the, the live rye plant doesn't do it, and a completely dead rye plant doesn't do it. It's the stage in between where it's kind of dying. And so typically what we recommend to people is that you get that rye completely dead before you plant your corn, or like what we did in that one strip, plant the corn, let it germinate, let it emerge, and then spray it out. And um, that, so that's kind of the general rule. We've never seen that on our own ground. I think a lot of what people are seeing that they attribute to allelopathy may be nutrient tie-up. And, and I know on the tours, they, they, they're seeing that out in these plots where they incorporated that rye into the soil and they're just tying up so much of the nitrogen that that corn looks yellow and stunted, which, you know, some people may attribute to allelopathy, but it may just be a nutrient tie-up. So you can overcome that, and I think Terry talked about this too, you know, if you're using rye as a cover crop, you need to make sure you have a good starter fertilizer program for that corn, because that rye is going to be very good at pulling all the nitrogen out of the soil and then it will release it later as it decomposes. So that's what the 10-day window is, just to avoid any of that allelopathic effect, because we figure in 10 days we can have that, brown, that rye completely brown uh, if you're using the right uh, additives with your glyphosate. If you don't put any additives with it, it may take two weeks to really get brown, 
but you can put things in it to speed it up. What do we do after double crop soybeans or after double crop corn? Uh, next spring, we will typically uh, come back to corn. Uh, typically not because when we double crop like that, uh, like say, you know, that corn we left standing in the field till end of November, 1st of December, just to try to get it to dry down. Now, double crop soybeans, uh, you know, obviously they're going to die with the first frost and then you can harvest them uh, shortly thereafter. We haven't done double crop soybeans for about four years, uh, but typically we figure it's late enough that we probably don't have a lot of other options. Most of our soybeans uh, that we harvest on regular time, we will come back with a cereal crop for cash harvest. So rye or triticale, uh, spring oats or spring barley or spring triticale, something like that. So we typically don't do a cover crop into those acres because we're coming back with a cash crop. And we'll put cereal rye into all the corn acres. Uh, and again, it was talked about widely yesterday. Cereal rye, you can plant that just about any time. You may not get much fall growth, but it's going to be there in the spring for you. What cover crops would work after double crop soybeans? When are you harvesting them? End of October. End of October. Uh, cereal rye, hairy vetch, uh, triticale, winter wheat. That's probably about it. Because you're, you just, you've run out of time to get any fall growth uh, of, of any uh, substantial amount. So you gotta go with things that are gonna be very winter hardy. The other option would be is you can wait till the early spring and plant a little bit more of a diverse mix. You could plant oats, peas, uh, rapeseed, some clovers. You could plant that in the early spring, you know, try to get 60 days of growth out of it, then spray it out and then plant your, your next crop. Some guys are doing that, especially the guys, uh, uh, parts of Kansas, they're planting grain sorghum or soybeans and they don't plant those till like the end of May. So they've got more time to be able to do that. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's not a lot of choices when you get to the end of October. I will, I, I will be up here. I probably am not going on the tours this time. So if you got questions, feel free to come up. I'll be more than happy to, to, to discuss those with you, but we probably need to get people on the, on the tractor. Thank you very much, Keith.